So when you get a buyer's earnest money check as the listing agent, you want to put it in this earnest money account. If you mess up and accidentally, or I would hate to say on purpose, you put that in your account, that is called commingling. You cannot commingle the buyer's money with your money as the managing broker. That is a license law violation. And remember, that's the buyer's money. You are just the one holding it. It still counts towards the purchase price. It's still a credit for him on the closing statement. So it's his money, not yours. You must have it in a separate account. If you mix them, that is called commingling. Now, here's another. If you accidentally put your money in the earnest money account, that is also a commingling violation, all right? Now, you can put some of your money to maintain the bank account. So let's say it's got a monthly fee of 25 bucks. I can put my personal money in there to maintain that account, but I can't put, let's say 10 grand in there because I'm trying to hide it from somebody. That's also commingling. So the second thing that usually happens after commingling is this other thing called conversion. Conversion is actually a criminal activity and is illegal. So if you put the earnest money into your general account, even if you do it on accident, and then the next day you write your rent check out of your general account, there is no way to determine that you didn't use their money so they actually say you're guilty of it. So what would happen is you would be charged by the real estate commission with commingling and conversion. These two almost always go together because no one really finds out commingling happens, especially if you're doing it by accident, until maybe the end of the month, you go to balance your checkbook and you realize, oh my gosh, where's the $500? And you see it illegally or I'm sorry, you see it accidentally got put in your general account. And since that date, you've written four checks out of your general account. That's commingling and conversion. They usually go together because you don't know it. If you put that money, earnest money into your account and it goes in and you go, oh my gosh, that's the wrong one. Take it back out, put it back in the other one. That's still commingling. You did it. You just caught yourself. So these almost always you will see brokers charged with in tandem. Commingling and conversion are the two. Now there is this thing that we have not talked about yet called equitable title. Equitable title is the interest that the buyer has in the property between the time frame of the seller accepting it and them actually closing it, right? That seller has an interest in the property. He looked at it, it had a great roof and four walls. He wants to make sure when he closes, it still has that great roof and four walls. So his interest is called an equitable interest or equitable title, meaning that he has some rights to that property to make sure that it doesn't change in that time frame. And if it changes through a destruction between that time frame that he accepts or writes the offer and the time frame that he actually takes true ownership, if that property gets destroyed, the seller is going to be liable to make sure that property is in the same condition that it was when the buyer wrote the original offer, okay? Now, I it says here that depending on the jurisdiction, either the seller or the buyer may be responsible. I'm telling you now, 
in all the states I teach in, I do not know any state that actually forces the buyer to be responsible. All right. It works on what's called the Vendor Purchaser Risk Act, meaning that the vendor, the one doing the selling, is the one that Bert carries the risk. It is his house. If you wrote an offer with a to a house that had a roof on it the day of closing, you certainly don't want that roof to have been blown off and the seller go, oh, well, you know, not my fault. Yes, it is. And you've got to put that house in the condition it was when you quote unquote sold that house to them. All right. Liquidated damages, that is the compensation the seller or the buyer will get depending on who breaches it. This is another misnomer. You hear people all the time where they say, well, if the buyer doesn't buy, the seller's going to keep his earnest money. I'm telling you that's technically not true. What the seller is going to keep is this thing called liquidated damages, which is numerically equal to the earnest money the buyer gave. It's important you understand this because I told you that earnest money is a credit to the buyer. It will always be a credit to the buyer. If the seller wins a lawsuit and gets awarded liquidated damages, that is a credit to the seller. Earnest money is always a credit to the buyer. Liquidated damages is a credit to the seller. What happens is that liquidate or that earnest money actually changes names to liquidated damages and then it goes to the seller. All right. It's kind of like saying I scored a touchdown in hockey. No, those words don't go together. All right. So a seller does not keep earnest money. A seller keeps liquidated damages that is coincidentally equal to the amount of earnest money that the buyer put down for the property. I was in, involved in a court case where the judge literally looked at me and said, Mr. Modulin, how much are you holding? And I said, well, we're holding $500 of the buyer's money in earnest money. And the judge said, okay, I find in the amount of $500 for liquidated damages. Raymond, give that to your client. Because that's how it happens. All right. There are some provisions inside of the sales contract. And we are not going to actually go through all of these. Because you are, should be obvious as to what they are. And once again, there is not going to be a question that says, name prov four provisions of a sales contract. We all understand that there's that date of closing. And remember the other day when I said that the listing agreement had a closing date? <clears throat> and I said, no, because they don't on the listing agreement. It actually is inside of the closing or the purchase agreement. That is that time is of the essence frame. When that buyer says, I will close in 30 days, that date is the date we need, and that establishes that time is of the essence inside of that purchase agreement. And there's all kinds of things. Now, there's this thing called a contingency, which we're going to get here right in just a minute. If there's personal property, like, hey, I want the washer and dryer to stay or things like that. So those are all those con things that are going to be inside of the sellers or inside of the purchase agreement. So we mentioned this word called a contingency. A contingency is a legal valid reason that is agreed upon between the parties for one party or the other to maybe get out of the purchase agreement. Sometimes you will hear them called escape clauses, all right? A contingency must be cleared or met for the purchase agreement to be fully enforceable. 
if one of the contingencies cannot be cleared or cannot be met, then that purchase agreement is not enforceable. And that contingency has to include certain things within it. Like what is the actual contingency? What is necessary to solve it? Is there a time frame with which to clear that contingency? And if it doesn't get cleared or it does get cleared, are there any costs involved with it? And which party is going to pay for that cost? Sellers will accept a buyer's offer with contingencies in the deal as long as they know they can be met. So there are some common contingencies that most, if not all, states use. The first one is what we call the financing contingency. The buyer is going to buy this property contingent upon him being able to get a loan. And if you think back on day very one, when I ask you, can I get paid on a deal that doesn't close? And I told you yes. And you said, well, wait a minute. What about when that time when my buddy couldn't get a loan and that guy didn't get paid? Ta-da! He couldn't get a loan. There was a contingency. So actually, he wasn't a buyer. He was a wannabe buyer, right? We get that all the time. So that is a very common contingency. If I cannot get a loan, that is a valid reason that you, the seller, and I, the buyer, have agreed upon because I wrote that contingency inside of the purchase agreement. It also may be contingent upon the inspection of the property. You told me it was a brand new roof. I found out through my inspection that the roof is 412 years old. Therefore, I'm not buying and I legally get out of the deal because we had an inspection contingency. There is often what's called a property sale contingency. This is one that you hear about a lot, that there are very mixed emotions on this one. This is where the buyer says, look, I will buy your property, Mr. Seller, contingent upon the fact that I actually can sell my property because the equity that's in my property is the money I need to buy your property. And if I can't sell my property, then I can't buy yours. That is a property sale contingency. That's another common one that you will see. There's a one here called a lien holder. A lien holder is the like the bank that you owe money to. When there are short sales, now m some of you may not have heard of this, because they haven't been as popular in the last five to seven years because the market is so good. But back in 2008 and 2009, when I was still involved in this, um, there were a lot of short sales. Now, we are going to go into short sales in another chapter. But basically what it is, is when the mortgage company accepts less than what is owed on the property. Just take that definition and believe me for a minute and we will move on. So the seller owes a hundred grand, but the house isn't worth a hundred grand. It's only worth 90. That doesn't clear the lien. But the lender says, you know what? We'll take 90 and clear the lien. That would be a short sale. Well, if a short sale happens, you need the lender's approval to accept that 90 before the seller can actually accept the offer from the buyer. Because the buyer is going to say, I'll offer you 90. And the seller's like, well, I owe 100. I can't clear the lien. But let me get the bank to say they would take your 90 and clear the lien. That is a contingency the seller may put in the deal, 
where the lien holder has to approve taking less than what is owed.